surgery tomorrow. Honey unlocks the door. You know, Pat, I, I'm proud of you to say that because, you know, it's okay to testify in church. It's okay to testify anywhere, actually. The, uh, you know, why? Uh, I think I was 35 years old before I ever said amen in church. Because, uh, you know, the way I grew up, you know, you just kind of, kind of fought and sat there and didn't say much. And I know Mary Jean kind of grew up in a church like that. And we're very formal, very uh, ritualistic and all, but it's, uh, uh, you know, there's there's a way to conduct the church service, a way to conduct ourselves, and as long as it's all about uh, worshiping God, and bring praise and glory and honor to Him and not to ourselves, and I think it's a lot in church. And uh, uh, what time is serving in the morning? I don't know what time we have to leave our hands. We'll be in the morning. We'll certainly be in prayer. I uh, want to tell you, I, I, I just feel blessed to be here today. It's a uh, uh, first Sunday of 2014. Um, you, know, and I, you know, sometimes I catch myself saying this, you know, that there's, uh, uh, I don't know if there's any place that I'd rather be than be in church right now. Um, of course, you'd expect a preacher to say that, wouldn't you? But, uh, but I really do mean that. Uh, uh, in the previous church, we had Doc Bryant. Some of you may know her, Buck. Uh, they're, they're in their 90s. And uh, uh, many times in church, Doc would say it's, uh, it's good to be in the house of the Lord. And, and I just want to thank you for being here this morning. And I know that God appreciates it as I do having you here today. Uh, I, I, wanted to, uh, I wanted to share with you today some, just some thoughts. Uh, it, 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 you know, maybe when you get finished, when we finished here today, you were saying, golly, you know, he was kind of all over the place. But, and, and, and it may be that, but uh, there's just some things that I want to share with you today that I think that will help us in going forward in 2014. Uh, and, and it's not that, uh, you know, a lot of people say, well, you, you know, don't let the past bother you. And, you know, Jesus teaches us about worry. And uh, that's, a, that's, that's a very popular subject around our house. It's something that we struggle with, the Disney household. But it's, uh, uh, there's nothing that we can do about 2013. We talked about that last week. But I think that we can also remember that and learn from it and hopefully improve on it in the year to come. Um, I want to share with you several scriptures here this morning. I'm going to start out in Exodus 20. And most of you familiar with that is the Ten Commandments and, and I'm just going to scan through a, a few things and share some thoughts with you and hopefully that it will get our minds uh, in the proper frame, you know, moving forward as a church that uh, you know, I know that we have a, a copy of the Ten Commandments hanging in the Fellowship Hall over the piano there and, uh, and I know that uh, years ago uh, uh, judge here in town, one more, uh, made the news, and uh, he's, his name is pretty much synonymous with the Ten Commandments. And, and I'll just, uh, in, in the spirit of full disclosure, I'll tell you that Roy is a good friend of mine. Uh, a lot of people don't like Roy, a lot of people don't approve of what he's doing. Uh, and I'm not here to judge or promote him and, and his ideas or his ways, but I, I do uh, call him a good friend. And uh, from what I know about him, he's, he, he's a man of God and, and, and cares about what God thinks. I want to share with you the Ten Commandments. I'm not going to read the whole scripture. I'm just going to just read them off from 1 through 10. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make an idol in the form of anything that would represent a God. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. 
Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Now there's the first four commandments right there, and there's there's probably about 50 sermons in those four verses right there. And, but it's just something that I want us to think about uh, starting off. The, the four, the first four commandments are that relate us in our relationship to God. How we treat Him. How we deal with Him. Uh, the Sabbath, that's a that's a popular subject here these days because, you know, a lot of people have forgotten exactly what the Sabbath means. Um, a lot of people think that the Sabbath, the Sabbath just means getting up and going to church, and going home and going about your day and, and living your life. But the Sabbath is much more than that. And time doesn't allow us to go into all my thoughts on that today. But just think about that for a second. Number five, honor your father and your mother. Number six, thou shalt, thou shalt not murder. Number seven, you shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. Number ten, you shall not covet. And there they are, folks, the Ten Commandments. Uh, you think about uh, the Bible being God's instruction book to us on how to live our lives. Just think for one second, if everybody lived by these Ten Commandments, what better place this would be. It would almost be perfect if we did that. I'm not saying it would create perfection, but it would be very close. If we would just do those things. But we're human, and we have our own ideas and our own thoughts and our own ways. Uh, we want to do things our way and not God's way. And as you know, in the, in the New Testament, uh, Jesus, people follow the new commandment that Jesus gave us. And, and I'll tell you the way that I think about it, just the way that I can wrap my head around it. To me, when Jesus gave the new commandment, he just kind of summarized the Ten Commandments. He says, Thou shalt love thy God with all your mind, body, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And that's, that just summarizes the first four in the last six, the last six of the Ten Commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. You know, if we would just do those simple little things, it seems to be simple, but it's, it's a lot more difficult as we all know. Because, you know, people sometimes are hard to love. People sometimes are difficult. I know that, that, that I can be difficult, believe it or not. If you, you don't believe me, just ask my wife. I uh, uh, never intend to be difficult. It just seems to come out that way. But I just wanted to just start out by just, you know, we talk about the Ten Commandments a lot. Mostly it's in the news. But how much do we really talk about the Ten Commandments around our dinner table, around our family gatherings? I think I've mentioned this to you before. We went off with a, uh, a group of young people a few years ago on, on, a, on a summer trip, on a retreat. And just talking to the kids on, on the way up to Tennessee, asking them about morality, what were your morals like? And they had no idea what a moral was. Had no idea what it was. They didn't know what the difference between right and wrong. I asked them what the Ten Commandments were. And I think they maybe got one or two of them. Maybe three. But uh, it was uh, it was just shocking what uh, the lack of knowledge in our young people today. And we tend to blame our young people for that. But you know, they can't just have that transfer into their brain to have to talk. And it has to be taught by others. Now I want to share with you over in Matthew chapter 25. I'm sure that most of you are familiar with that scripture. One of my favorite uh, Bible verses in the, in the Bible. Uh, in my Bible, 
us how the sheep and the goats. How the sheep and the goats. And uh, I preached several sermons on this, and, and there's just you know, a wealth of, of knowledge in here that we can uh, glean from this. But uh, you know, basically, it's it's about Jesus coming back and judging us, and He's going to separate us, the sheep and the goats. The people who did what he asked them to do and the people who did So a question that I would have for us here today is, who do we want to be? Do we want to be a sheep or do we want to be a goat? Starting in verse uh, 34, it says, The king will say to those on the right, Come, you are blessed by my father. Take your inheritance. The king will prepare for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry. And you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty. And you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. And then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we do these things? And he answers very simply. He says, When you did it to the least of these, you did it to me. When you did it to the least of these. So Jesus calls us to look after the hungry, the thirsty, the stranger, to put clothes on people's back, to look after the sick, and to visit those who are in prison. And then he goes on to talk about the goats, the ones who didn't do what he said. And he, and he goes on and tells them what they didn't do, all the same things in the negative, and then they wonder what their outcome will be. And he says simply to those in the ghosts, in verse 45 and 46, he will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did not do for the least of these, you did not do for me, then they will go away to eternal punishment. You know, judgment, hell and damnation is not a really popular subject in the world today. You don't hear fire and brimstone preach very much, at least not in many mainstream churches. But folks, it's real. It's a real consequence for our actions, or in this case, our inaction. What didn't we do? When did we see an opportunity come and let it pass us by? I can think back in my 51 years on this earth, and I can tell you that I've had a lot of opportunities passed me by when I had an opportunity to do something good. And I look back and regret all those times. And as said, there's nothing I can do about those times. The only thing I can control is what's happening today and the days ahead. Now I want to go back to one, one point that Jesus mentioned uh, there in verse 36. It says, uh, I was sick and you looked after me. And here's the important one. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Now, I'm not saying this just because you know, I've been involved in the prison ministry. You know, I've been in prison and I've seen these, these folks that are hurting, that are there, they're trapped, they're behind bars, they're locked up, they have no freedom. <clears throat> wow. That's a, a, a noble thing to do is visit folks in prison. But I think there's other things that we can think about along those lines. There are folks out there that are homebound who can't get out of the house. Now, we don't like to think about them being prisoners, but they are. It's because of their health or whatever reason may be they can't get out. Um, one of the uh, toughest things out there for me to see is going to visit the nursing home. You know, we went to sing Christmas carols for those folks over at the nursing home a few weeks ago. It was just apparent. You know, I, I don't guess that they, well, I guess some of them are behind locked doors and can't get out even if they want to. And even the ones who wanted to get out, they're just not physically able. So they're, they're trapped. In they need people to come and visit. And then folks in the hospital. And we, uh, I think it's our obligation to go and visit people and see about them. But it's, it's what Jesus calls us to do as Christians. And my question to us today is, who 
which side are we going to be? Are we going to be on the sheep side or are we going to be on the dead side? Now, you may see a, a, a theme that, that, I'm, that I'm working toward here. It's about how are we going to live our lives? How are we going to act? How, how are we going to conduct ourselves in the year to come? Are we going to live by the Ten Commandments? Are we going to live by the teachings of Jesus? Are we going to go out there and we going to see people? Are we going to help people? Now, let me tell you, it's real easy for, I mean, this is a 24-hour day, seven-day week job. And, and, and Jesus doesn't expect any of us to devote every minute of our day to do this. But when, and being realistic, we all have our lives to live in. But, if we'll just open our eyes, there are opportunities that come into our life each and every day where we can help somebody in some small way. Sometimes it'll be an opportunity for a way to help somebody in a big way. But there are a lot of little things that we can do, say a kind word, open a door for somebody. I try, you know, when I'm walking up to, wherever I'm walking up to, if there's a door somewhere and I see somebody coming, I try to always be, uh, cognizant of that, and I'll just, and I'll just wait, and I'll just open the door and let them go. And it, it's, what's amazing to me is the surprise that I see on their face when I do that. Most of them say thank you, some don't say a word, and that's okay. But I, it, it just really is amazing to me how many people are surprised that somebody would stop and open a door for them and let them go. Because in the busy, hurried world that we're in today, everybody wants to be in front of somebody. And if you don't believe me, just head toward the checkout bar and your grocery cart. And see how many people just, I mean, I was, somebody was telling me a story, I don't know if it was here the other night. Somebody just came and just knocked them out of the way and pushed their cart and just went from them. I don't know where I heard that story. But I mean, it was just, it, it, it would be comical if it wasn't so sad but it's the world that we live in today. Now I want to uh, move on with our theme here about how are we going to conduct ourselves uh, in the coming year. What is, what is God calling us to do? I mean, there's a lot of instructions here in the Bible, but there's a general theme there. It's about touching people. It's about touching people's lives in a way, sharing the love of Jesus with them. And I'm not talking about going out on the street corner and waving your Bible and screaming, you know, Jesus saves them. I'm just talking about just being nice to people. And, and people will ask, people will ask the question, if you exhibit uh, the spirit of Jesus with them, hey, tell me about why are you so different? People will give you an opportunity to share Jesus with them if you'll just let them, if you'll give them the chance. In the last part of uh, the book of Matthew, chapter 28, you've all heard this a million times. I'm going to read it to you again. Verses 16 through 20. It's most people call it the Great Commission. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some still doubted. Now, I want to stop right there for just a second. You heard me talk about it either last week or the week before. How we talked about, I think it was last week, when we talked about Joshua, how the, the, the Hebrew children were always renewing the covenant because they had forgot about the previous covenant they made with God. All the things that God had done for them, yet they still just drifted away. Still they just couldn't grasp hold of that. Still they weren't uh, fully on board. Now you think about this. Here's Jesus' disciples. Saw him, nailed to a cross, died, buried. No question he's dead. He reappears to them, and yet some still die. How in the world could somebody doubt that? He was his closest disciples. And they, 
it, it's just kind of hard for me to wrap, wrap my head around, but that's what happened. It go, goes on in verse 18. It says that Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the end. Go and make disciples. Go and make disciples of all nations. Baptize. Now, let's just Let's just be plain to hear for a minute. It's, you know, when you, when you think about Fort Bend United Methodist Church um, and what I guess a lot of people would call a sleepy bedroom community, a very nice place to live. You wonder, you know, how does how does that really affect us? You know, that's that's really for for those mega churches out there to go and make disciples of all nations. That's, that's for the big church. Well, folks, I'm just here to tell you that that's just, that's just as much meant for us as it is for the biggest churches in the world. Now, how are we going to do that? How can we make a difference? Well, it's just, it's very simple. We do it one person at a time. You know, I think back as I was reading this morning, our upper room, I hope you all got to read that. I didn't write his name down, but I think it was his. I think his name was Eric. Uh, maybe they used another. I know it was a different name, I think. But uh, he was a young boy that uh, was one of the three kings in the Christmas play. <clears throat> and his, to summarize it, he posted a letter in the newspaper. And he, he wasn't asking for big fancy things, a football. Or, and Xbox and all those things that kids ask for today, and iPhone, all those kind of things. He was asking for the simple necessities of life. He was asking for a blanket, a pot, pots and pans, a refrigerator. You see, he didn't even have running water in his house. And we think that, well, you know, that's that's really not around here. But folks, it is around. It's, it's, it's amazing how needy people are around here if we just open our eyes and we look and see. There are people out there who need the love of Jesus. And I tell you, we can go, we can knock on the door, we can give them a Bible and tell them that Jesus saves. But I, I think that what Jesus really wants us to do is he wants us to just to share his love with them through our lives. Allow them to see Jesus in us and how we act and how we operate, how we conduct ourselves and what a difference Jesus has made in our lives. Because I can tell you this for sure and for certain. Whatever good that is in me and the man that I've become today, and believe me, I've got a long way to go. But whatever you see standing before you today is simply because of the love of Jesus Christ and the grace that I have received from Him. And that love and grace didn't just fall from the sky and I received it. Somebody had to share that with me. Somebody had to talk to me and tell me about it. And I'd go in that back room, that, in that Sunday school room, Rainbow City First Baptist Church over there, and the guy had to share with me the story, and I'd pray the prayer and ask Jesus in my life. That's where it all started. Now, there's been lots of ups and downs in the last 37, 38 years. A lot of drifting away, a lot of coming back. But it was because of people that loved me and cared about me and shared Jesus with me. Now I want to finish with one other scripture. It's, it's the same story uh, told by Paul over in Acts chapter 1. And uh, the disciples, uh, the same setting about seeing Jesus 
after the resurrection. So it says in verse 6 in Acts chapter 1, So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Now you remember, everybody was looking for a military leader to just take it over and just finish everything right there. And Jesus said to them, said this to them, It is not for you to know the time for the day that the Father has by his own authority, as set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And I know that you've heard that scripture many, many times. So where are we to go? Where are we to go in this Fort Million United Methodist Church? Well, it's, it's very simple. Jesus tells us where we're supposed to go. We're supposed to go to Jerusalem, and Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Well, it's, I think there's 14, 15, or 16 of us here today. It's kind of hard for us to cover the whole earth. Uh, yeah, that's true. But you know, you, you kind of condense this down and, and make it realistic for us today. You know what? What is saying here is talking about in Jerusalem, in your town, in your community. We're talking about holding me. He's telling us that that's where he wants us to be alive in this world. And you know, everybody in this in this community of Horton Bend is not going to receive that life we try to share it with. But Jesus calls us, it's our responsibility for us to, to share that life with people in this community. Now, I, I'm new to the church, and I know that there's been a lot of outreach that's been tried in the past. And, uh, you know, but that doesn't mean that it's not going to work the next time. And I don't have the answer of exactly what that is. But I can tell you one thing God does. God has the answer for us. And how he wants us to reach out to folks. Reach out to folks. And if you just look at it from our point of view, Judea would probably represent Edible County. Or maybe just maybe even a smaller it just draw it a little bit smaller. Say, you know, Gaza, Rainbow City, and Southside. That would be Judea for us. And then Samaria. Maybe that's all of that all county. Maybe in this Calhoun County. Maybe up in the Cherokee County. Maybe spread down just a little bit. And into the ends of the earth. Well, the ends of the earth maybe just be in Alabama. You know, for now. Maybe 2014. Maybe that is the end of the earth for us. But who knows? You know, the ends of the earth may be the whole United States, maybe North America. And I know a lot of people say, well, preacher, you know, we're just a small little church down there. You know, we've been there a hundred something years, and, you know, we've just never grown, never, never just done what, you know, we feel like God has warned us to do. And, uh, but, you know, there's, folks, there's things that we can do. There's things that we can do, and that's just open our hearts and be willing vessels for God's plan for our life. Now, I know that I've kind of asked, but I guess it's just a question that, that we just got to ask ourselves. You know, where do we see Fort Bend United Methodist Church being in six months, a year from now? What do we want from this church? That's, it's, it's something that's it's an important question that we need to ask ourselves. You know, and, and that's one reason I wanted to start with the uh, with the Ten Commandments and just you know, giving a baseline. You know how we need to conduct ourselves, and then you know that Jesus is calling us to go out there and touch people. <clears throat> now, that doesn't mean that every one of us have to do every one of these things. It may be. A small group does one thing, and another group does another. But what do we want to see happen at Horton Bay United Methodist Church? That, that, that's something that we've got to ask ourselves. But a more important question, and you've heard me say this before, and you'll probably hear me say it many more times. But the more important question for us to ask is to try to find an answer to 
is what does God want for this church? I think that God has great plans for this church because I look around here, I know most of you, don't know you very well, but I, I feel like I'm a pretty good judge of character. And I think that we've got, uh, and this is meant in all seriousness, we've got a pretty good cast of characters here. We've got different talents, different ideas, different thoughts. And I think that each one of us have talents and, and abilities that God can use to, to accomplish these things in our church, in our community, in touch of people's lives. I mean, you just never know how, with technology the way that it is today, you know, it doesn't just have to be the neighbor next door. It could be very, as easily, as, as simple as Mary Jean's childhood friend who lives in Australia. You know, it takes about three seconds for her to send an email to somebody all the way in Australia. And it's a way for Mary Jean to touch somebody's life halfway around the world. It just lighting a little spark like that can make a difference in people's lives. But folks, it's just something that we have to do as a church. I have to do it as your pastor, and each one of us has to do it as part of the congregation. What do we want for Fort Bend United Methodist Church? But more importantly, what does God want for us? What is His plan for us? Now, I know it may seem like an overwhelming task for us, you know, because it's real easy to, to make excuses when you're a small church. It's real easy for us to do that. It's real easy for me to, to go to a meeting with my uh, district superintendent and, and, and the folks and leadership and say, well, you know, we do a lot, but you know, we just don't have many people, you know, and it's, it's easy to make excuses, but that's not what God wants. God doesn't want excuses. He wants a really hard. And what I see here before me today is the folks who are willing. And I think the most important thing for us to do is just come together and just support one another. And let's pray about this and, and figure out what God wants to do with this church. I mean, I think we have a great location here. And, and I think the, the folks that God has assembled here, and make no mistake about it, each person here is here because God wanted you to be here this morning. It's not just a random, you opened up the phone below you and said, I think I'm going to go home This is all part of God's plan. I truly believe that. And I would just ask you here this morning today to just, we we're going to meet tonight, but we're going to put it off the next week. The next seven days, let's take some time each day to truly seek God's plan and His will for our lives and for the lives of this church. Pray about that. And let's come back together next Sunday. And if we meet next Sunday night, let's all come with a willing heart and an open mind and a willingness to serve God. I truly believe that God will bless that faithfulness. I believe it with all my heart. And I just... I just want to tell you that uh, um, I had uh, had no idea that I would be standing in the pulpit today for the last two months. It was uh, it was part of Joe's plan to take off at least until next summer, and then you know consider another church day. But you know, God has plans that sometimes differ from ours, and uh, so. Uh, I'm here, at least for the time being, as long as you guys want me here, and uh, I, I just feel like it's a, it's a great opportunity for each one of us to, to step out and step up and to truly find God's plan for our lives. I think we've got a good start, and I think we're headed in the right direction. I think we just need to seek God's guidance in moving forward. And I would just ask you to join me this week as we, as we pray for that guy. If you would, let's bow our heads as the musicians come. Lord, I just pray that, uh, that you would just give us the wisdom and the patience and the desire to seek your will for our lives. Lord, I just pray that you would give us this help this week. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.
our service this morning and turn to page 348 as we sing softly and tenderly Jesus' call to the first and last verse. We'll sing as you're ready.